just worshipping the Lord <clears throat> and I believe there's like a there's a real timeless quality like nothing else you experience when you're really worshipping the Lord together you forget about time you forget about the clock you for, isn't there that's it's, it's a truth isn't there there's something really special about that like we don't experience at any other time so it's a real special and it's something we need to kind of hold on to and never let go it's really precious to, to us. And it's really apt because what I want to talk to you uh, about this morning is, is the timeless quality of our Heavenly Father. Amen. There's a, a very familiar scripture in Joel 2.25 where it says, I will restore to you the years the locusts have eaten. I'm sure we're all familiar with that. And it's worth just really just pondering upon that, isn't it? How do you restore time that has, has been lost does that mean like God has to give us like eight days a week instead of seven? Uh, Maybe an extra month in the year so we can catch up? No, we're talking about something supernatural, aren't we? Something really supernatural where God's timing is so perfect, but it comes from a completely different dimension to our understanding of, of time here on earth. Because time to us is it's like, we're always like looking at our watches, looking at the clocks. Well, I need to do this now. I need to do that then. I better get that done quickly because I need to do that a bit later on, you know. And I just, I was, I was pondering on this a lot. I was thinking, how did it get to that point where modern life became so subdued by, by time itself, by time? I really don't believe that's what God had really intended for us at all. It's like, it's particularly this time of year, if you notice, you go through November and you think, oh, Christmas is miles off. You know, and then as soon as it becomes December the 1st, it's like, ah, no, Christmas is nearly upon us. It's just like in the twinkling of an eye, isn't it? Just go from the 30th of November into the 1st of December. It's like, oh, no, I've got so much to do. What am I going to do? Oh, no, it's horrendous. And that's the way time has become. And I think we, we need to actually really delve deep into the timeless quality of God so we can rediscover and regain the years that the locusts have, have taken from us. Because we're time obsessed in this modern society. Absolutely time obsessed, aren't we? There never seems like enough time to do what we really want to do. Isn't it? It's always like there's chores to do. There's a schedule to meet. I mean, the modern thing now is like everyone has to have like a bucket list things to do before you die you know if you haven't swum with dolphins Barry if you have not swum, swum with dolphins yet you haven't lived oh, okay God. so come on let's get to it folks we need to get that bucket list done before we, before we die but it's crazy isn't it why, why are we even like thinking in, in that kind of realm when we worship an eternal God an eternal God but we do we live in this time obsessed culture where it's all about time management. If you've ever worked in corporate circles, you'll know how this has such, become such a big thing and invaded modern life. It's all about time management and productivity. We've got to tick the box. Tick the box, tick the box. Time in motion. Yeah, I remember all that in my old council days. We've got to meet the deadline, haven't we? As long as we're getting it done, that's all that counts. We've just got to get it done, whatever it is. But we've got to get it done. It doesn't matter what it is. Let's just get it done. How did it become like this? It creates so much pressure, doesn't it? it creates so much pressure. Have you ever watched the program Countdown and the Countdown Conundrum? And you've got 30 seconds to solve this Countdown Conundrum. But the thing is, they don't make it easy for you. They play the most annoying music, which adds to the pressure. It's like... Ding, 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 ding. 
and it gets built up towards the end. How are you supposed to concentrate while that's going on? It's like someone asked you a question. Right? I need the answer to this question in 10 seconds. Go. 10, 9, 8, 7. So, you know, you can't... <laughs> you, you can't focus. You, there's so much pressure on you. And that's the way that modern life has become to us. And that has invaded the church as well. That's invaded the church. One thing I really like about this place um, is the fact there's no clock on the wall. Now, it's not either a green light to take advantage of that and I'll start showing you all my holiday snaps for the next six hours. No, no. It just means that we don't have... We, you know, it's like when we're worshipping, we just forget about time because we're in, we've entered into a different dimension. We've entered into God's timeless dimension, which is amazing, isn't it? It's amazing just to, just to throw away all those... Cast away all those uh, worries and anxieties about what we need to do. You know, I bet someone's got a chicken in the oven right now, and you're thinking, "I oh, hope he doesn't go on too long because the chicken's going to burn, or it's going to become it'll become so small it'll be like a, a sparrow, you know, because it'll be in the oven too long." But don't worry, I'm not going to take that long to, to bring this message. So, don't worry. If you have any time worries, don't worry. Okay, which is kind of what this message is about. So we do, we serve an eternal God. What, what is eternity? I mean, think about this. What is eternity? God exists outside of our own perspective of time. Because like, time is a creation of God. If you go back to the book of Genesis, God was around before, before days and nights were created and before the seasons were created. He was there before, before all that. But we do, we, we're so, you know, it's all about past, present and future, isn't it? It's about the hours of the day, the minutes of the day, and it's getting pressurised now down to the seconds of the day. But God's not like that. He's not, he's not pressured by time at all. I believe there is no time in heaven. There's no time. Can you imagine getting to heaven and, and say, oh, this is taking a bit of time. This is getting on with it. It's getting a bit boring, this, you know. How many years of this? Eternity. This is going to go on for it. You know, you're not going to be thinking, you're not going to be clock watching in heaven. Oh, you know, you're not going to be worried about time or anything. And God wants us to kind of tap into that timelessness. Eternity is not, in fact, a thing about time. Although we think that, we think time, eternity is like time forever and ever. It's like days and days and days going on. Years and years and years. In fact, I want to suggest to you something. Eternity is absolute. in fact, the absence of time. Time does not exist in heaven. Yeah. Well, we'll get on to the, the, the presence. We'll get on to that. You're, you're a step ahead of me here, which is really good. So there's no time in heaven. It's imme- it, eternity is immeasurable. We tend to think of eternity, we try and measure it, don't we? Think, Gosh, I must be gone all these years. But it's actually something that's completely and totally immeasurable it's like space like time and space is kind of like part of our existence here on earth but like those two things time and the space that we live in seems to be like the two sort of main things that in our existence here on earth but even like when you look out into space you basically you get a glimpse of eternity because there's no end to it to the universe scientists now have found out that a lot of space is actually travelling away from us faster than the speed of light. Now that means, right, this is mind-blowing, that means a whole load of the universe we will never see or understand ever. It doesn't matter what we do, it doesn't matter how far we look with telescopes because, because it's travelling further away than the speed of light, it can never, the light from it can never reach Earth quicker than the speed of light. So there's this whole part of the universe we don't even know about and we will never know about. Now, that's, that's mind-blowing. But I, I like that. I like, I like the fact that there's a lot of stuff out there we can never know or understand because it actually defines about who God is, that he's so much more vaster than even than our understanding. So we could study the life out of everything and we would still never understand or know about these parts of the universe. I like that. I think that's amazing. Because it's just, wow, God, you're so vast and more awesome than we can ever understand or ever imagine. And that's how big and awesome God is. It's amazing. 
And it's the same with time, that's space, but it's the same with time. God lives in this dimension outside of our understanding and perspective of time. The Bible says in 2 Peter 3 verse 8, it says, To God, a day is like a thousand years. Now, if you're one of these people who takes everything literally, you'll be thinking, oh, well, so a day is a thousand years. Okay, so let's do the maths here. So a week, well, that's, that's 7,000 years to God, because seven days, you know. But he's not, we're not talking literally here, are we? There's a lot in the Bible that we, you know, if you try and take the, the Bible completely literally, you're going to, like, tie yourself in knots. So it's not everything's like, it's actually a figure of speech. What it's saying is that God is, is completely outside of our perspective of time. It's like when, when, when uh, in the Bible it says, seven times seven, uh, 70 times seven, forgive your brother. It's not saying after, you know, the, the 490th time, that's it. <laughs> yeah. you, you've crossed the line now. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, but that's it. You're not being forgiven anymore. No, these things are figures of speech, but it, it helps us to understand just how awesome God is. Amen. Beyond that, that, we, that we never lose the wonder of God. That, you remember that, that song that we sing, you never lose the wonder. It's absolutely incredible when we start to think and take a bit of time because it's hard to, to get time to think about these things anymore. But we've got to, we've got to, we've got to get that time. We've got to get like those that the, the locusts have taken away from us. Get that time back so we can actually start to ponder on just the vast and awesomeness of God. So there's no time constraints with God. I think that's amazing. I think Another thing I was thinking about was, if there's no past, present and future when we get to heaven, because we're completely outside of time, think about that. Think about that. It's like, when you get to heaven, you won't be waiting for loved ones to come and join you. You won't be waiting for loved ones from the past to come and join you. We'll all be there at the same time. Think about that. That's incredible. I, I, I really believe that. I really believe that. It sounds crazy, but I believe that when we get to heaven, even the people that we've just left behind will be there waiting for us. And the people that go before us, when they get there, will be there waiting because there's no sense of time in heaven. It's, it's eternal. It's eternal. It's mind-blowing. <laughs> so there's no time constraints with God at all. So when we talk about the past, we don't need to have regrets about the past. You know, because often we can think about the past and, oh, I didn't do this and I didn't do that. And, but if you live in that place, you know, God's not doesn't do that. God doesn't look at the past and think, well, you should have done this and you should have done that. He's completely wiped out the past with all its sins and we're completely forgiven. It's incredible, isn't it? And there's no need to live on past glories either. You know, you can live in regret about the past, but we don't need to live on past glories as well. Think, well, I did X, Y and Z, so that's me sorted. Thank you, Lord. I've done it. I've, you know. We don't even need to go down that road either. And when it comes to the future, we don't need to look at the, into the future with anxiety or even apathy. Either of those are two kind of like opposite things, but we don't need to look at either of those things when it comes to the future. Because the way that we look at the past, we look in a negative way with its regrets and all that stuff. And if we look at the future with anxiety, it can cause us to come into the present and press the panic button. The panic button of the now. And we can easily live like that because we think, I need to get all this done now because I don't want to be seen as a failure in the future. And I don't want the people look back at me and say, I didn't succeed in what I was doing. All of these things add to the pressure of time upon us. But we don't need to live like that at all. We need to be free from all of that. So we need to be free from the, the, the regrets of the past. We need to be free from the anxiety of the future. And we need to be free from the panic of the now. We've got to go out and get the whole world saved. Come on. What are we waiting for? It all sounds virtuous, doesn't it? It sounds good. And, there's, and it is in a way. But it can create fear. And when we start to do things out of fear and anxiety, we're not really operating in the way that God designed us to operate.
Because when God talks about the past, like in 1 John 1 verse 9, he says he's forgiven us all of our iniquities. All of these things, they've just been completely wiped away. He's not going to bring them back up and say, well, I knew it. I knew it. No, he's not like that at all. So we don't need to dwell on our, what we conceive to be our, our past failures. We don't look back. You know, who, he who puts the hand to the plough. If you look back, your, your plough will be ooh, like that when you start looking back. And when it comes to the future, we don't need to worry about tomorrow. It says in Matthew 6, verse 34, it says, For today has enough problems of its own. So we don't need to worry about tomorrow. And of course with that, that doesn't mean that the problems of today, we have to sweat over and struggle with either. Because when it comes to the present, Jesus says in Matthew 11, verse 30, My yoke is easy and my burden is light. So things that we, we think are problems right in the now don't have to be weighing us down with burdens. But that's the, the language of the world, isn't it? The, the language of the world is always trying to tell us that time is short. It's trying to tell us that we need to grasp the opportunity, grasp the moments. I've been to, to like management seminars years ago about all this kind of stuff. And it, it just fills you with fear. Because like, oh no, I'm going to blow it if I don't get it done now. You know, and it feeds the fear. Because what they're after, they're after the productivity. And church can be like that. Sadly, church can be like that. It can push us into that place where we become so fearful of not succeeding. We become so fearful of failure that we end up in this, this sphere of thing where, where time is just running out constantly. And as I've said already in the start of this message, eternity is completely timeless. So we don't have to worry about these things. We don't need to make a big list of things to do each day. When did life become about the to-do list every day? You know, we just, it's become like that. You know, we're just like, right, I've done that, I've done that, I've done that. And you get to the end of the day, oh no, I haven't done that, oh no. I'll have to put it on to tomorrow's today list. And we just live life from one today to-do list to to-do list, <laughs> day after day after day. And God's got so much more for us than that. I mean, look back to the Garden of Eden. That was some hectic schedule in there, wasn't it? Everyone, they were so busy. Even the Lord, he was just, he was just walking around the garden in the morning. <laughs> and Adam and Eve, what did, the only thing it said they had to do really was to tend the garden which I don't think actually needed a lot of tending. I don't think there was a lot of weeds in, in the Garden of Eden. And the other thing they had to do was name the animals. Well, it's not, it's not a hectic schedule, is it, to be, to be fair? You know. And that's how it should be for us today. We, we shouldn't have all those pressures of time upon us. We should just be able to go out and enjoy what's around us, what's around us. And out of that place of rest and out of joy, Things will happen, you know. We'll bump into people, we'll meet people, and we'll get talking about Jesus. And suddenly you're like, hey, I'm an evangelist. You know, but it won't be like, I'm going out today to be an evangelist, and I'll show them. It'll just be, it'll happen so spontaneously and supernaturally natural that it won't be a heavy burden upon us at all. And that's how it should be. I love the story about uh, Martha and Mary in uh, Luke chapter 10 so if you want to just turn there I, I love this story it encapsulates so much about what we've just been talking about Luke 10 verse 38 to 42 as Jesus and his disciples were on their way he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said but Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. 
Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. You know, I, I read that again. I've read it so many times. And I read it, and I just seem to get so much more out of it than I'd read before in the light of what, what we've been talking about, about time and stuff. So we have Mary there who is sitting at the feet of Jesus, completely attentive to what Jesus is saying. She really understood that that was an appointed time to sit before the Lord and just listen and just to bask in his presence. And then we have Martha, who it says was, was distracted. So first of all, think about it. She, she's got the Lord of Lords, King of Kings in her house and she's completely distracted. I mean, we would never make that mistake, would we? Come on. But it also says that she was angry. So she has like, anger issues with her sister because her sister was not helping out at all with what she felt should be done at that time. But she then also starts to play the blame game. <clears throat> Has anyone ever played the blame game? <laughs> she starts saying, don't you care that my sister... So see how she's pointing it onto her sister. Don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. <laughs> I mean, you've got the Lord of Lords, the Kings of Kings, and all she can, is concerned about is, Lord, tell my sister to come and help me do, lay the table, do whatever it is. And I want to suggest something here, which I haven't seen before. <clears throat> Martha had an addiction problem. An addiction problem. We tend to think of addictions as we we I mean, when we say the word addiction. Oh, thank you. When we say the word addiction, we immediately. <coughs> think that's help, actually. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> When we say the word addiction, we immediately, the things that come to mind are alcohol, drugs, gambling, sex, you know, like the big things that we think, well, these are the, that's where addiction lies. But actually, Martha had an addiction here. She was obsessed with doing, getting things done, you know, to the point that it obsessed her so much. The Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, is sat in her house and she can't even find the time to, to listen to what, what he's saying. That's, an, that's addictive behaviour, that she would totally miss that. She also had an addictive behaviour in the fact that she was addicted to approval because in the scripture you see her seeking the approval of the Lord to say, this is what I've been doing, Lord, Surely you must recognise what I've been doing and how good and virtuous it is. And yet you're entertaining my sister who is not doing anything. <laughs> so it's a form of addiction. An addiction. See, she could have said, it would have been quite easy for Martha to say at that point, yes, but this is my ministry. This is... I'm fulfilling my duty. This is my calling to do all of these things. But that's not the way the Lord said, because the Lord was able to look deeper into her very being. And he said this, he said, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about, he didn't just say about one thing, he said about many things. So he actually saw into her very soul and saw a troubled heart. And it, but it wasn't just about all the, the, the stuff she was doing. It's like, you're worried about many things. So she could, he could see that she had a lot of deeper issues going on in her life. And then he said, which must have really upset Martha, he said, Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. It will not be taken away from her. Because Mary had an encounter with eternity, with an eternal God. 
she, discovered, she, she received something that day which was eternal. It will not be taken away from her. Whereas Martha received something which was just temporary. Or that's what she was looking for. She was looking for approval for her good works. And it, but that would have just been a temporary. Jesus could have said, oh, well, Martha, thank you. you, you, you that's really kind of you. And well done. But that would have been it, you know. But Mary received something much more powerful, much more, uh, something that was stronger that was going to stay with her for eternity. So I want to suggest this morning that addictive behaviours are actually a lot more common than what we think. And I believe that we actually, it's easy to look at the alcoholic, isn't it? And, and the, the, the drug addicts and say, well, that's where addiction is. Addiction's much deeper than that. Much, much deeper than that. I think it's something that everyone has in their lives because as small children, we learn these behaviours. I mean, my grandson now, he's just coming up to two years old. And you can see these things, um, like addictive behaviours, like, because kids, they, they see something they enjoy and they grasp onto it, don't they? They're going, right, that's it. And our wee grandson, he's obsessed just now with doors. He's constantly opening doors, closing doors. You know. Then it's curtains. Then it's blinds, you know. Doors, curtains, blind doors. It's like, oh, my, it's exhausting, you know. <laughs> but that's, that's we, we were all like that at one point, where we all just, we, we went through life and we became obsessed with things, you know. And that's where our addictive behaviours started, just when we were young. It's just something that we've all, or we've all been through, we've all experienced. And I've never really seen all this until I started reading this Martha Mary thing in a new light. So it goes much deeper than we think. It's because there's, some, there's a part of our soul which is empty and it needs to be filled. It needs to be filled. You know, it's, it's one thing. We can, we can remove what we're addicted to. But you can't remove by doing that. You can't remove the reason why we're addicted to it. So it's like, take the alcoholic, for example. You can remove alcohol from their lives. And you would think, right, well, that's problem solved. Because the alcoholic cannot get access to alcohol anymore. And it's, that's, a, that's helpful, but it doesn't always deal with the root issue because it doesn't deal with the, the addictive behaviours. And the addictive behaviours are constantly looking for something else to, to, to become addicted to. So, so we can be set free from something or we can appear to be set free from something, but we're not fully free ourselves on the inside. And that's a, that's a, a reality that I think every human being on this planet experiences at some point. We've all been obsessed with something or other at some point in our lives. It's just, it's part of our makeup from when we were very young. I want to read you a scripture in the light of what we've just been speaking about. I'm going to read this scripture and now think about it in the light of what I've just been talking about, an addiction. 11, chapter 11, 24 to 26. When an evil spirit comes out of a man, it goes through arid places, seeking rest, and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes seven other spirits more wicked than itself and they go in and live there and the final condition of that man is worse than the first so something's changed think about that in the terms of what we've been talking about addiction so again we'll take the alcoholic as an example the alcohol alcoholic finally manages to get rid of alcohol the spirit of alcohol out of his life and the spirit of alcohol goes off 
and then it, it gets seven of its pals. It says, let's go back and see how this guy is doing. So it goes back and it finds the guy looks free. The house has been swept clean, completely free. And it goes, tries to get to go back into that house. And the alcohol thinks, no, I'm not having the spirit of alcohol back in my life. Go away. I'm, you know, that's what I'm completely focused on. Go away. But the problem is, the other seven pals come into the house and take refuge. What are the seven pals? Well, it could be anything like um, pride, self-righteousness, sanctimonious attitudes, impatience, intense obsession and worst of all religious spirits well I don't know if you've had experience of this maybe in your own life or um, with other people but sometimes when you've got rid of something out of your life it makes you so vulnerable to a whole load of other stuff coming in And and Jesus says that the situation ended up worse than it was to begin with I mean it sounds horrendous doesn't it Particularly if it's a religious spirit. So a religious spirit, and I've seen this so many times. I've experienced it. That religious spirits come in and take over. And it seems so virtuous because I've given all this up. And now I've got this. But then the pride starts to manifest. The (coughs) self-righteousness. The sanctimonious, the impatience, all of these things. And I've seen it, I've experienced it, I've done it. Thought I'd arrived. Next thing I'm on some sort of sanctimonious crusade to set the world to rights. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. People just think you're some religious nutcase and they'll cross over the other side of the road and, and keep as distant from you as possible. So we need something more. We need something deeper than those experiences. We were just singing about it, weren't we, about experiencing God's goodness. We need something far, far deeper, far, far more aligned with who God is so that we can get away from all, all the, the, the stuff that's holding us back into the things that we can get a completely new experience of who God is his timeless quality his timeless quality where we just we enter into a completely different dimension with him otherwise we'll just go, keep going around the, the, the same circles all the time and, and have little impact Lord bring us something Bring it fresh. Bring it new, Lord. When was the last time you just spent time basking in his presence? Well, we just did it, didn't we, when we were worshipping the Lord? We just had that time. But we, we do it because it's like, it's an allotted time. We've kind of we've set it in stone, haven't we, that when we come to church on a Sunday, we'll have a time of worship. And, and that's okay, that's good and everything. But when was the last time we had that just walking down the road or just in, even in the workplace or in the supermarket when do we just or even just at home just do you know what I've got this to do list but sack that I'm just going to spend some time in, in the Lord's presence you know when was the last time we did that when did you just have some family time yeah, you know, yeah. we can be so busy for the Lord sometimes that we can even just forget about family time or what we think is being busy for the Lord. And the Lord saying, no, just go and have some family time. <laughs> so it's time, it's time to lay down our burdens, to stop worrying and to just enjoy the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And I believe there's a huge amount of healing in that. There's a huge amount of healing that when we just spend time 
just as we've experienced. Did you experience God's healing when we were just worshipping the Lord? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's a time when we can experience this. You know, and we're not even doing it with a huge amount of understanding. We're just, we're just in his presence. And it's like, that just seems to be enough. You know, I mean, understanding's good and don't get me wrong on that. But when we're just in his presence, there's healing in that. The Bible says that there's healing in his wings. You know, when we're worshipping the Lord, it's like, it's that mother hen, isn't it? It's just, it's like he's just got his wings around us and we're just in his presence and we feel so safe and secure. There's nothing better than that at all. You know, I've been searching for something better than that for 30 years and I still haven't found this. No. Just being in, in the Lord's presence. So lay down your burdens. Stop worrying. And just enjoy the God-given life that he's given you. And out of that place, out of that place of rest, God will, God will de- deal with the, the church building. God will deal with the evangelism. God will deal with the preaching and the teaching and and everything. God will deal with the worship. God will deal with everything. You know, I came this morning because I, I knew folks were aware of them. How on earth are we going to get this machine up and running here? You know, but it just it just came. It happened, didn't it? Because it wasn't working at first. And it was like, oh well, Lord, over to you. <laughs> you know. And he never lets us down, does he? He never lets us down, ever. Praise the Lord. Let's just pray. Hallelujah. Father, we just thank you for your presence this morning. Lord, help us, Lord, just to bask in your presence so that we can just experience, Lord, everything that you have for us. All of your goodness, Lord. All of your goodness. Help us to stop worrying about the future. Help us to stop regretting about the past. And help us to stop panicking about the right now, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you exist in the whole of eternity. Lord, you're in the past, Lord. You're in the past tidying up all our messes. Lord, you're in the future preparing the way for us. And Lord, you're in the now, Lord God. Lord, just just being with us, Lord. Just, just being always there for us. We thank you for your presence with us. Well, Father, just help us to grasp that timeless quality so that, Lord, we can just experience your perfect timing in everything that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Amen.